Hi, my name is Lizzie Chan, and I'm a member of the CPI Institute's Young Leaders in Alternative Dispute Resolution. I'm delighted to host today's episode of the CPI YADR Corporate Council Interview Series. The YADR seeks to educate the next generation of leaders about the full spectrum of dispute resolution and prevention mechanisms, and to provide an insider's view on how CPI's community of in-house counsel, external counsel, and other experts in the ADR field are using dispute prevention and resolution mechanisms to manage conflict to enable purpose. As part of this goal, I'm hosting this interview series inviting in-house counsel to share their experiences in ADR and other best practices, and also to, also to share their advice for young practitioners. Today, I am delighted to welcome Tope Edeyemi, who was a financial ombudsman in the UK from 2014 to 2018, and who is currently a barrister at 33 Bedford Row, based in London. Tope, we're so delighted to have you with us today. Oh, thank you very much, Lizzie, for the invitation. I'm delighted to speak to you today. Thank you so much. My first question for you is, can you tell us a little bit about your career experience and how you came to join the Financial Ombudsman Services as a financial ombudsman? Yes, so I um, became a, a qualified as a barrister in around 2011. And at that point, I used to go to court daily. I had a um, quite a broad case mix, a, a common law case mix. I'd represent people in hearings and I typically go to court every day. Um, and then I began to trans um, build up my expertise in regulation. So professional regulation and other areas of regulation. And I thought that this is actually a really interesting area. And um, I, I, I came across um, information about the Financial Ombudsman Service. Um, and I, I realized that they were recruiting for ombudsmen. And I, at that point, I didn't really know much about alternative dispute resolution. But when I began to look into the ombudsman service in a bit more detail, what I re realized is what they what they specialized in was resolving disputes between financial institutions and consumers and the ombudsman would be the individual that would facilitate that resolution um, of uh, the dispute and it just it sounded to me like a very good opportunity for me to build upon my regulation and um, regulatory experience but at the same time um, really benefit from learning about this form of alternative dispute resolution, looking at um, disputes from the perspective of a decision maker rather than the advocate, because I really was involved in this kind of highly adversarial um, contentious work on a daily basis. And I thought I can step back and um, look at things from a different perspective. So I, I basically found out about the role and, and applied. And that's how I came to, to, to get the role. You have such an interesting perspective to share with us today. You've mentioned this briefly already, but I was wondering if you could elaborate a little on the role of the financial ombudsman and the types of disputes that came to your attention. Okay. Um, well, the ombudsman service is a statutory dispute resolution scheme, um, and it's set up under a, a piece of legislation called the Financial Services and Markets Act, FISMA, um, essentially. And um, the, the point of the organization is that um, consumers um, who have complaints about financial institutions can bring their complaints for free to the Financial Ombudsman Service to get a final binding decision on that um, complaint. And it's an alternative to going to court. And the array of matters that they deal with um, are, are quite, or the, rate, the, the types of matters they deal with, although financial, are quite broad in nature. And, and the financial value of those claims are also um, broad. Um, 
so that is essentially what the financial service um, financial ombudsman service is it's free cons for consumers to bring their complaint but it's funded by the financial institutions be it a bank or other kind of um, financial business they pay a levy on a yearly basis um, and that there that contributes to the running cost of the ombudsman service uh, and within it i should add that while the ombudsman is the the one of the senior individuals within the organization they also have a number of um other um, professionals that work within it um up until around 2017 they had adjudicators so adjudicators would be the individuals who initially would consider these disputes and if um the parties couldn't agree then it would go on to the ombudsman and it would be the ombudsman who would write a final binding decision on the dispute so it was kind of the second step in a two-step process but there were also other slightly informal but quite effective ways of trying to um resolve the dis these disputes that fell outside that two-step process can you elaborate a little on the different ADR tools that you commonly used in your role as financial ombudsman? And could you also comment on whether certain, certain of these tools were more amenable for certain types of disputes? Yes, yeah, so um, although it wasn't formally we, we, I would I would say mediation was the one of the key. So although it wasn't formal um, mediation, so we wouldn't call it a mediation. But if somebody brought a financial dispute, and um, say they had an issue with an insurer, and um, they were very unhappy with that insurer's interpretation of the provisions of the insurance, and they felt that actually their their claim should be paid out. You know, the, 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 the structured approach would be for the ombudsman um, to consider the policy, the insurance policy, um, have a look at, consider what went on um, and the circumstances of the claim and the decision making process of the insurer and determine whether or not what, what the outcome um, that um, the insurer reached it, it was was correct and, and give their view. But there were, there were also means of not really get, kind of not having to end up writing a decision and you could you could speak to either party um and and say okay this is their position um and it seems to me that the actual dispute here is actually um quite minor really um and this is what um perhaps your your customer is asking you to do and i wonder if this would be something you would consider. And that would, and if, you, if it were, we could finish, you know, we could bring this to a conclusion today. And often um, when you cut away from all of the formality and all of the needing to, to write large um, or lengthy submissions on a point and just hone in on the actual issue and ask whether they would be willing to facilitate that, um, sometimes you'd be able to bring the matter to a, a, a swift conclusion. And I think that the key would be not to, to make anybody think that you are fettering your kind of objectivity or, dis or, or, or thinking on the matter. You know, you're not, you're not saying you have to do anything and you're not saying that if you don't go along with what, I, what I'm suggesting, I will not find in your favor when I write my final decision. All you're saying is that actually um, it, it does seem like a solution could be reached here quite quickly and that would save you both much time and actually be quite beneficial to, to, to both parties. So that was a kind of a form of, I thought, mediation, negotiation that I found was often quite effective because sometimes um, the, the both parties didn't realize that that's what you could you could you could do that you know you, you put instructions um, on a website uh, as to how to bring your complaint and equally the financial um, institution is provided with guidance on how to respond and what they're expected to do and and that's a slightly more informal aspect of it is not set out and um, so when you call them to say actually um, they'd be happy to accept this. Um, is that something you'd consider? They think, oh, okay, well, let me think about it. And sometimes you'd get come back with, you'd get a very positive response at the end of it. 
it's really interesting you mentioned that you would talk to the party and you know use informal ways to try and resolve a dispute so it sounds like you were you tended to be quite proactive in these arbitral proceedings mm. would that be an accurate description and do you think being proactive is a good thing I think it, it, it's a, it's beneficial. You have to see you it, it you take it on a case by case basis. You know, some people, um, some financial institutions or businesses are very structured, and they and the, the individuals that are handling these disputes um, are not empowered to make many decisions. So you know, just that scenario I gave you there, where I'm saying, you know, would you consider? just dealing with the matter in this way um, and, and, and paying out a claim on this basis. Um, th they would say, look, I, I, I can't, I'm not, I'm not able to make such decisions. All I can do is provide you with the information as to what happened, provide you with our position, which is that this claim does not fall within the provisions of the insurance policy. Um, uh, uh, and that's that. So sometimes it's simply not possible. You, you do have to push a little bit when you get those responses. Um, but there will come a point where you recognize that actually this person is not trying to be difficult. They really have a very limited mandate in respect of their um, ability to, to divert from their instructions or their kind of, um, you know what they've been told to do and then on the other hand from the perspective of the consumer um that will vary some re some 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 will benefit from a some it's, for some people it's not about money or it's not about getting what they want they're not content with how this financial institution has behaved and they want to see in writing what a third party who is independent has to say on the matter so they don't want any kind of mediation you tell me what you think in writing and and I'll, i will take it from there you know that's sometimes the the the, uh, the roundabout response you get so you you take it each case each case as it comes and <clears throat> and oftentimes um, it, it just simply isn't appropriate. You, you, you can get the sense that it's going to lead to confusion. Um, it's going to lead to um, the generation of more documentation and more, um, it, it will just annoy the, the respective parties. So you just have to see how, how, what sense you get from the individuals that you're dealing with. You make a really good point about how it's important for the ombudsman or a decision maker in any disputes process to be very experienced and mm. to really be listening to the parties uh, in order to be able to decide what's going to be the most useful tools mm. to help the parties reach uh, a resolution and as you mentioned also accountability. And then you mentioned documentation before, and we talked about how some of the disputes that you saw were quite document heavy. So from the perspective of a financial ombudsman, what do you think are some best practices for reviewing or handling a large amount of documentation? Uh, so I think by the time I joined the ombudsman service in 2014, they had pretty much transitioned to paperless um, working so individuals would you know parties would bring their complaint and it and it would be um if, if they did post it it uh, in in the form of a paper file that would have been um sorted by a separate team who would scan all that documentation onto an e-file and then that would be available for the ombudsman to review um sometimes um and most of the time people would actually send it in the form of an e um electronically in the first place but thankfully it would already have been sorted into this kind of e-file um, so I think that the, the, the my kind of way of marshalling this information would be when as soon as you're allocated a particular matter to consider would be to open up that e-file and just have a an a, get an idea of what documents you have um, what, how they look, are they opening? Do you know what I mean? Because you, from, from a perspective of managing your time effectively, you don't want to say, I'm going to deal with this um, from 
on Monday morning and hopefully really get a good idea of what I, I need to do um, and hopefully be in a position to do a first draft or make a decision by 1 p.m. if I start at 8 or something. But then you get there and it, nothing's opened, something seems corrupted, a key document is missing. <clears throat> so one of my best practices would be, uh, and before you even decide you're going to start looking into it, have a look at what's on that e-file and um, check, you know, if the main um, documents are there. So for instance, at the Ombudsman Service, um, a, um, can, a consumer would typically fill in some sort of application form or be it if there's no application form, there would be a, a letter of some sort detailing what the complaint is about. And that time, time, from time to time, you might not have that. And I personally found it a bit disorientating when I'd have the file and find that's not there. And then, you know, typically a business is supposed to respond um, and um, that, that response should be on there. Um, but they should also provide key documents. So if somebody's saying that um, I um, entered into a loan um, in 1988 and the... Um, I was given X advice and I was told the interest rate was so and so, you would want to see that loan agreement, you know, the, the, the consumer may not have it, but the business should. So you, you need to see that and what you sometimes get is they, they would, they would submit all sorts of documents, voluminous documents, but then that is not there and you just think, to, and, and so you just think, well, what is the point of this? Do you know what I mean? And I sometimes would get quite annoyed. So I'd, I'd, I'd have a look to see what have I got? Is it relevant? Can I read it? Is it opening? Um, and how long is it going to take me? And I, I would often, um, you know, I print out certain key documents. So that's something like the loan agreement that I'm going to be reviewing quite frequently. I would print that out and obviously keep it securely and ensure that it's um, um, you know, not somewhere that it, it could be accessed inappropriately. But uh, you can make your own decisions as to, to, to what, you, what documentation you may wish to have actually um, in hard copy form that you can use alongside the um, e-file. So I think um, that's, that was my, that's really how I tried to go about it. And I found that it worked quite well. Um, you know, once you have an idea of what, how long, it, how, how bulky this file is, and what you've got and what you've not got, um, and how, and the format of this, of the documentation, you can get along quite efficiently with reviewing the information. You make a really good point. I think the first practical one, just checking that you can even open the files. Mm -hmm. mm. It's a great point. Um, and then to your second point about choosing the key documents, that reminds me that as you know, counsel and international arbitration, where there are lots of documents, it's really incumbent on the council to select the most important documents for the tribunal. Mm. Yeah, it's you know, signpost and make and make life a little bit easier um, for for people so that they kind of are able to get to the crux of the matter. Um, I think that exactly. is. Yeah, we were always taught at work that, you know, especially with the post-hearing briefs, we should really try to help the tribunal draft their award, you know, by identifying all the issues that are going to make a difference to the ultimate decision and to identify the documents that matter. My next question is, uh, what were the types of consumers that typically use the financial services um, ombudsman? And did that give rise to any particular challenges? They were they were a, a, a array of people really, um, just individuals um, who had accessed. So in terms of financial sophistication, they would vary from just standard to quite sophisticated. Um, but they, but generally, it was just a cross section of of, of society. Um, in my observation, that would would. Um, would handle and um, would make complaints. So one of the um, perhaps most famous um, areas of um, dispute that uh, would, was dealt with by the Financial Ombudsman Service was payment protection insurance, which was this kind of um, form of insurance 
um, that would was marketed or was was said to provide a consumer with the ability to pre pay off their credit card um, in circumstances where they might not be able to because they'd lost their job or something like that. But the method in which it was sold um, was sometimes considered to be dubious and people brought um, a lot of complaints about the missed sale of this PPI because it would often increase their monthly credit card costs by a significant amount. Um, and the people that would bring complaints about PPI were very varied. Um, and, but then you also had bit small businesses could also bring complaints about other financial institutions as well, as long as they weren't too big. So I, I can't remember the exact number of employees, but there was a limit. I think it was, was under 10. So you did have businesses. Um, and then the level of, and when I talk about financial sophistication, I think we know what that means in terms of how much, how much somebody knows about different financial products. Um, but there would also be a, a, a variations in the way in which somebody would be able to present their complaint. So um, many people are literate and can write well, but there are those who, who struggle with writing well, be it um, English is not their first language or um, they have some sort of disability that's either visible or not visible that affects their ability to type or, or, or write a complaint. And they will do their best, but what you will get sometimes is a is a kind of complaint letter, a, 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 an application form or a, a letter that, or a telephone call that has been transcribed that is, you'd need to really listen because it's not straightforward to determine what the issues are. But what I learned was that it's important to be patient and not to write something off on the basis that it's not very well presented because within, what they have said, um, you will, you, you, there may well be, and a lot of the time there is, a very valid point. So, for instance, now, say somebody's written a, is essentially saying that um, they took out a mortgage and they were not in, advised that that mortgage was an interest only mortgage. So they thought they were taking out the mortgage on another basis and that they were actually paying off the mortgage loan. They didn't realize that what they were sold was an interest only mortgage. So they may send a letter and so 25 years down the line where they would have and say they've taken out a 25 year mortgage, at that point they should have paid off the mortgage, but now they realize they were only paying out the interest. And that happens quite a lot of time, you know, quite a lot people will complain and say, I thought I would, you know, I was gonna be 55 and I've paid off my mortgage. They're telling me now I've only paid off the interest. But what they might say, they'll send a letter with various bits and pieces. Um, and for some reason, they haven't really identified that this is the issue. So they say, I've been misinformed, um, this happened, this and that. Um, and you think, well, what, what are you saying here? I just don't understand. You, and then you, you, you see a small passage where they say, and the, the issue, and the, the reason why they may not be in a position to articulate their complaint well, is they don't actually know the distinction so they'll bring a complaint and say something like, I thought I would have paid this off by now, but they're telling me it's not paid off. And then you think, well, I, you know, what is, what is the issue? But it's when you begin to read it a bit more, you begin to realize that what they're saying is they thought that they were entering into an agreement on one basis. And that's what they were told, but actually they were entering into an agreement on another basis. So you have to decipher from what they're saying, what the real issue is. And it, 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 you can make the mistake of perhaps uh, make, uh, you know, not necessarily considering something properly because you've not um, taken that extra time to muddle through what they've written. The, the consumer that you've mentioned in the interest only mortgage situation, it sounds like a, a really difficult situation, even very tragic for the 
uh, for the consumers who are involved. And it sounds like it really takes a lot of patience and a lot of listening and uh, proactiveness on the part of the ombudsman or the decision maker to really understand mm. what are the issues at the heart of the dispute. And I was wondering, are there any skills or experiences in your role as financial ombudsman that you've taken with you as a barrister and as an arbitrator? Yeah, definitely. I think um, the ability to distill complex issues, because yes, yeah, some things are very simple. Here are the terms and conditions, or here are the um, provisions of the agreement. Does this, um, you know, does it apply? And, and, and you just apply it. Um, you just use basic skills to, to apply it to the scenario. But a lot of the time, I found that it was necessary to, to I, I, I developed the ability to find out what the key issues were and what was important in relation to the dispute. And, um, I, and that required me to, to really understand how to read through large documents and get to the heart of what was actually at issue. Um, so, so that was one, one skill. And then the other thing was the actual process of writing these final decisions, because these final decisions are binding, but they could be judicially reviewed. Um, so you can't appeal it, but you can judicially review it. And I think, you know, some of the well-known grounds for judicial review is if something is um, not reasonable, you know, the, the individual who you, you've met, you've, you've reached a conclusion that is not based on the evidence um, or the actual reasoning or rationale for it um, is not particularly, doesn't follow from the information that's been provided or that you've um, actually made an error. You know, you, you've said a, a provision relates to, um, applies in one way when in fact it does not, you know? So uh, the ability, and then there's also the readability you know, it's, as I say, these, these matters um, are brought by consumers, you know, they're of varying levels of, um, in terms of various, who have various needs, and it needs to be clear. Um, you can't hide behind jargon. What are you saying? Um, and that needs to be clear. And initially, um, and I found that there was a skill in doing this because I would often um, go to my colleagues um, and ask, you know, for them to read it through. But you'd also get a lot of feedback. And I realized the more that I wrote these decisions, the less um, feedback I would get because people understood it, whether they were, whether it went their way or not. They knew clearly what had I considered. Why did I come to this decision? Um, what weight did I give to particular pieces of information as opposed to um, other pieces of information. Um, and um, there was also the Ombudsman Service also has a fair remit. So yes, you have to look at the rules, the regulations and the law, but you also have the ability to make a decision. You, you, you can also make a decision based on what you think is fair. So you bring that into it as well. Um, and the so what you, you write, it needs to be reasonable and fair. Um, and also um, at the same time, correct legally. Um, so I think balancing all of that was a skill that I learned through practice and through really um, ensuring that I, 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 I wasn't just operating in a silo. I would take into account what people had to say and the feedback I would receive and take advice on how to better um, draft these final decisions. And I've, I've, taken, I've taken that process into my um, um, work as an arbitrator. And also when I um, act as counsel, I focus on clarity. I focus on ensuring that you know, what I'm saying is accurate um, because that does foster credibility. You know, I, one of the things that I, I was brought to my attention um, when I was um, starting out as an ombudsman is that minor errors of fact do undermine the credibility of the decision as a whole. 
So yes, you might not have got the law wrong. You might not have got the um, provisions of the agreement wrong. But if you say something, you know, if you refer to the um, business being located in a city that it was not, or the consumer um, entering into the agreement on a date that's incorrect, even though really it doesn't make much of a difference, they suddenly begin to think, well, they've got all these little things wrong. Actually, how accurate is the whole thing? Um, so that att attention to detail is quite important. And that's something that I, I, I um, really try to ensure I, I, I focused on and I've, I've taken that principle with me. And then the, the, other, issue, the other kind of skill was that you dealt, you dealt with a whole load of financial products, actually. So the Ombudsman Service started off having um, a lot of specialisms, and they still do, I believe, but they, they moved to um, requiring Ombudsman to have perhaps to, um, to deal with a large range of um, disputes in relation to a, a, a broad range of um, financial products. And what that meant is that you had to get apprise yourself with the um, fundamentals of a financial product that might be in dispute. And that's actually quite a challenge. But once you begin to do it, um, you, you, you know what you need to look for um, in order to quickly understand a different topic. Um, and I think that that was something that I was able to bring into my kind of work as an arbitrator and as counsel. Thank you so much for these really interesting insights. And I thought your comments about clarity, readability and attention to detail were especially interesting and important. What, was, what is your advice for young practitioners who are watching this interview, uh, who are looking for a career in-house or another regulatory role? Um, I think you, you should definitely think about what you would hope to achieve when you're there. Um, so that and hold on to that while when you're there, and it will then enable you to know um, where, where, when it's appropriate to move on, and also to focus you whilst you were there. So, for instance, when I joined the Ombudsman Service, I did clearly have um, my one of the key things that I was looking forward to was drafting these final decisions in these disputes. Um, looking at the evidence and, and acting in this kind of quasi-judicial role. So I spent a lot of time ensuring that the quality of my final decisions was high and that I really um, refined the, the process of, of, of writing these things. And that was, one, that was one of the main things I wanted to achieve. And it, it got to a point when I felt that I've, I've learned as much as I can in respect of this kind of skill set. You know, I've, I've been able to develop this skill um, in writing binding decisions um, to the extent that I can at this organization. Um, and while the organization had many other opportunities and, was, and it remains a very good um, organization, I thought it's now appropriate me, for me to move on. Um, and I think that is useful um, to have in mind. Obviously, uh, if, you, if you're to join a, um, if you leave private practice and you were to, to join a, I don't know, a ship broker or an insurance company or a client, uh, just a commercial business of some sort, your, the, the primary thing is for you to do a good job for the people that have employed you. But you, it's, it's not inappropriate for you to think, um, I would love to really get an idea of this market sector. Um, and I want to know about this aspect, these aspects of how this business operates and have a reason why you want to, to know about it and how you're going to get, how you're going to acquire that knowledge. And that will keep you motivated. Um, and as I say, it will enable you to, to, to understand when it might be time to, to move on because you've, you, you've realized that particular ambition my last question for you is, what's your general advice for young practitioners in the ADR field? 
my general advice for young practitioners in the ADR field is to, you know, they, 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 there's typically some sort of foundation that you are drawing upon in order to enter the ADR field. Um, and I think it, it, it is important to ha obtain a firm grounding in that. So if you are a lawyer, um, yeah, I, I think you said young practitioners, if you are a lawyer and your background is just commercial law or be it um, something else, um, really understand the technicalities of your area um, because that will be the, 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 the springboard for which you're able to launch your career um, in, in ADR. And it, it, it's it, whilst um, marketing and um, being involved in, in different activities is crucial, um, you do need that technical ability um, uh, because then you can, that, is, that, that does come through when you begin to um, work in the, the field of alternative dispute resolution. Um, and I think the, the other thing that is, is, is useful is to, um, you, you know, is to, is to listen to, to advice and then decide what you want to take on board, because that's one of the benefits of, of um, being a, a younger practitioner. You're able to, act, you know, pe people do often want to give you um, advice. And um, perhaps pe people might be more reticent to, to correct or advise when you become more senior. Um, but whilst you're um, developing in your career in the early years, you will get a lot of constructive advice. And I think it's, it's important to have an open mind and, and listen and, um, and um, take, take good advice on board because it, it does really help. So that's my advice. Thank you so much, Tofe, for taking the time to have this interview. I have learned so much from our conversation and I really appreciate the insights and advice that you've shared. Oh, so thank, thank you so much, Lizzie. No, it's been my pleasure. You know, I was looking forward to speaking to you today, speaking with you today, and um, thank you very much. Thank you again, Tofe, and thank you to our audience for tuning in.